Uh, I believe that there are mysteries and uh, that uh, it is impossible to parse all of God's uh, movements by applying to them the, the, the substantially uh, uh, resourcelessness uh, of our own minds. I don't, uh, I mean, ask me a simple one. <clears throat> Can I account for the five-year-old who, before we finish tonight, will have uh, fallen in from a rooftop and be killed? No, I can't account for it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that uh, the, I don't think that the abundance of uh, incidents of that kind uh, causes uh, uh, is, is are sufficient grounds for rejecting a revelation. Well, I'm not sure I would either, but I'm not sure that that addresses the question. But let's go, move from the theological to the scientific, which is what uh, Michael suggested I could do. I'm trying to figure out now what it is about evolution that you find so intellectually challenging, that you reject it. Every single major scientific development over the past uh, many decades that could have demonstrated that evolution was fundamentally flawed, every one of them proves quite the opposite. You all remember uh, Gregor Mendel's bean experiments and uh, in terms of experimenting on inherited characteristics. We all studied that in high school. Carbon dating that shows that the Earth is billions of years old. Had it proved that it was very young, we would have had uh, many evenings at the bar to discuss that. And even DNA research that shows that the DNA in chimpanzees and gorillas and humans is so close to being so the same is, that uh, we must have had a common ancestor. With all this evidence on one side, what line of science contradicts those powerful lines in support of our argument. Well, what is, what is in my judgment, it, it, uh, has happened uh, is an, a rejection of the materialist explanation of everything that has happened. Uh, uh, at the time that Darwin uh, spoke, he seemed to give us a facile explanation for a lot of phenomena which we couldn't uh, otherwise uh, explain. But I think the developments of the last hundred years have given us a perspective and that that perspective uh, makes increasingly uh, unrealistic the notion that there is a materialist explanation for everything that's happening around us. Remember that you, you're saddled with some heavy baggage, Mr. Dawkins, who says, we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It, well, Mr. We Dawkins don't, we isn't don't here, so we're not yet prior. saddled with him. Sorry? He's not here. We are not saddled with him. Well, I'm just asking you, you a question you get about science, you, you, which might make you more comfortable than the, the questions about theology. You, you better practice the excommunicative arts. Uh, <laughs> <very good. laughs> well, one final question. Fifteen years ago, before Pope John Paul II made his most recent pronouncement, he said this, Sacred Scripture wishes simply to declare that the world was created by God. He continued, the Bible does not wish to teach how heaven was made, but how one goes to heaven. Do you have any fundamental problem with that? None, whatever. Well, neither do I. And I would once well, again offer you the same opportunity offered earlier by Michael to join this side and to separate the two kingdoms. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much, Thank you. Professor Johnson. Professor Johnson. Professor Johnson, it's your opportunity to be, or opportunity, if you wish to think of it that way, to be interrogated by the opposition team. Who would like to start? Uh, Mr. 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 Johnson, uh, your um, career seems built on, on picking alleged fleas off of the dog of evolution. But when it comes down to picking the fleas off, you find they're just pieces of lint, not really serious problem for the dog. But you never seem to want to discuss your dog so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about religion. The talk about Noah's Ark, for example. Do you believe that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, at least baby dinosaurs? Or do I don't make any reference to the Bible or biblical authority. I, I don't uh, uh, deal with that at all, and I uh, really don't have an opinion you about it You don't have an opinion. It. Okay, well, let's say that uh, this book, which is widely distributed in uh, creationist circles and uh, used in, in schools, home schools, and religious schools at this point, has, a has nothing to do here. with me. Well, I'm going to ask you about why you don't do something that the, those of us on this side do. Here's a little picture, man and a dinosaur. Adam wasn't scared to watch dinosaurs eat because all the creatures ate plants and not meat. Now, do you think that's good biology, number I have, one? I do and not, and, two, and in fact, I have uh, said on many occasions and have urged uh, persons in the conservative Christian community to put aside 
the whole Bible issues, and let us ask the question, what is actually known from scientific evidence as opposed to materialist philosophy okay, you're about great the claims lawyer. of evolution? You're a great lawyer, but you didn't answer the question. I want you to know, if, to tell us if you think that this is not so silly and dangerous kind of ideas to plant in the hands of high school students that, that, that in fact, the There's, Flintstones are some kind of documentaries. Yeah. That's pretty that dangerous. Is, yeah. The kind of thing, I, I haven't it. seen this, the just kind of thing you're carriaging it. certainly is silly, just almost as silly Good. as the work of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> All right. And is damaging. Professor Miller. That it is, and I mean that, do you see? Dog, you know, what, and, and the work of those who say that uh, material processes can no. explain the entire living world. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. No, that's all right. Okay, all right. Um, I'm sure it will surprise no one I have one more chart. <laughs> and we have heard mm -hmm. over and over again that there are gaps in the fossil record, there are missing forms, and it's been implied the only reason they could be there is because evolution is not the explanation. I want to show you a very famous gap. It's a gap between mesonecid mammals, uh, land-dwelling carnivores that lived, oh, 55, 60 million years ago, and archaeocetes, which were the oldest whales. We know from skull and dentition patterns that, as it turns out, these whales are very closely related to mesonecids. And my colleague directly across from me, Michael B., he once wrote, if random evolution is true, there must be a large number of transitional forms between mesonecid and the ancient whale, and much in the way that Dr. Berlinski has said, he said, where are they? Well, they're right here. Two. Three. There turn out to be, there turn out to be three transitional forms, including a complete skeleton named Ambulocetus natans, which turns out to be an extraordinary intermediate. And here's the point that I want to ask you. It turns out that all these fossils are found in the area where the Indus River empties into the Indian Ocean. They're all in the right sequence, and furthermore, they form a transitional series. Now, here's what I want to know, Phil. You keep saying, where are the transitional forms? Paleontologists dig them up. What's the matter with them? Here's what the matter is. The, the most important point to me um, is that the fossil record is most conclusively undarwinian, just where it's most complete, in marine invertebrates. Um, and that is uh, why it is shocking that one finds that where it's the most incomplete and where the imagination can have free play, that's where you get the examples. We don't know that these form no, a transitional changing. sequence they're at changing. all, and you don't know how it could have happened and by what mechanism. And, I, and if you do, I wish you'd publish the paper on it, because okay. I'd love to see hang it torn to bits. Hang on for a second. I don't want anyone to miss the point. Dr. B, he said, where's the transition? Mm -hmm. Philip Gingrich and others dug up not one, not two, but three transitionals. Are they transitionals? We don't know that. You know, I would think in a fair fight, you'd say, you know, darn it, no. we were wrong on that one. You guys got the evidence. Okay, here's one for uh, your side. Uh, but what's uh, happening is... Uh, I can quote to you from an article in Science says that they are not, cannot be placed in an ancestor uh, descendant to see. Uh, no, no, point. no. Well, we're going to have we to all... miss it. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I'm done. Professor. You're done. <laughs> you're free. Thank you very much. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott, it's your turn. And this, who would like to be in the questioning? Mr. Berlinski. Dr. Scott. Oh, I, All right, go ahead. Dr. Mr. B, you're, <laughs> you're champion. I asked the there. captain. <laughs> he said, okay. Um, in the recent fundraising letter of uh, National uh, Center for Science Education, you state that when the ACLU wants to know what's this intelligent design stuff, we're there to for inform them that it is indeed a religiously based alternative to evolution, completely outside of science. Okay, now let me give you a quote uh, from an astronomer named Fred Hoyle, who discovered uh, things called resonance energy levels uh, uh, for carbon, oxygen, and helium, and found that they, they are arranged uh, exactly as they uh, must be to support life. Uh, Hoyle wrote, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a superintellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Uh, I have two questions. How is his concluding intelligent design from the facts of astronomy different from concluding intelligent design from the facts of, say, the bacterial flagellum? And second, are you going to sick the ACLU on, on Fred Hoyle? <laughs> Fred Hoyle is a distinguished astronomer, as you pointed out. When he speaks about biological um, phenomena, 
I would not say that he speaks ex cathedra. Um, he was speaking as a matter about of fact, astronomy. one of the one of the statements that Fred Hoyle made with Chandra Rick, Wickramasinghe is that actually insects are smarter than than we 